Hello, my name is Gavin Gordon. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Market Development here at Akoya Biosciences. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to speak today. And I'll be talking to you about how spatial biology approaches are being used to drive innovation and predictive biomarker discovery and validation in oncology, specifically immuno-oncology. Precision medicine approach is largely developed out using NGS and targeted therapies is moving to immuno-oncology. The reason is because progress here is gonna require a spatial biology approach to biomarker discovery, not just to characterize all the phenotypes and the complexity of the immune system, but also understand where these cells are in the body. Are they in the tumor? Where in the tumor microenvironment are they? What other cell types are they interacting with? All of these are important questions in determining how a tumor is going to respond to any given immuno-oncology drug. It's not possible to get this level of detail and complexity of analysis using a traditional NGS approach. Clearly a protein approach that incorporates a spatial component is going to be needed. Multiplexed immunofluorescence is one such approach. So what evidence is there, if any, that this type of approach might be useful in immuno-oncology biomarker strategies? Well, in this JAMA Oncology paper, representing a meta-analysis of almost 60 studies, the author set out to answer that exact question. Looking across all of the papers, encompassing almost 10,000 total patients, 10 solid tumors, they compared multiplexed immunofluorescence to tumor mutational burden, gene expression signatures, as well as conventional single marker pdl one ihc to identify which of these platforms had the best predictive capability for overall survival immuno-oncology drugs. The authors found encouragingly that multiplexed immunofluorescence had as a single modality the best predictive performance as shown via these rock curves in the lower left-hand side of the screen where MIF is represented by the blue curve, protein spatial phenotyping. And of course, the further these curves are shifted to the left, the better the test. So this was a really interesting study. It certainly wasn't conclusive by any means, but it did provide evidence that this type of approach could be useful in immuno-oncology. Akoya has two primary multiplexed immunofluorescence platforms that are being used across the medical and scientific community, including by our next speaker, to do exactly this. Look at protein spatial phenotyping in oncology. The CODEX platform provides the ability to look at almost 50 markers simultaneously, uh, but at relatively low throughput, a few samples a week. On the other end of the spectrum, Phenoptics, including the high-end Vectra Polaris, allows interrogation of up to nine protein markers but in tens of samples each week, hundreds of samples each month. So there's clearly some trade-offs here between the number of markers that you can look at and the number of samples you can evaluate them in. So drilling down in Phenoptics just for a moment, because this is the platform that provides uh, most of the clinical and translational researchers with their data, you can see the trade-offs shown here. And what most folks are finding is that six to seven markers is really the sweet spot for translational studies. It allows a whole slide scanning in about 10 to 15 minutes in analysis uh, and allows the evaluation of hundreds of samples each week. So it really forms a nice way to test hypotheses that are identified using the codex and other platforms in disco discovery driven research. So what sort of issues does a spatial biology approach to biomarker discovery encompass? Well, let's start with the goal. The goal is really a test that provides an operator independent algorithm that encompasses the data in millions of cell types and a almost infinite array of potential spatial measurements and drills that down to a single actionable and optimum score, a plus or a minus, a yes or a no, something that provides a readout to enable assignment of therapy in immuno-oncology. There's at least three scales. You can explore a spatial approach uh, from top to bottom or uh, low resolution to high resolution. You can look at the tissue architecture 
the tumor, the stroma, other non-tumor elements in the tissue section. You can look at the tumor microenvironment, different areas of tumor that have different combinations of immune cell infiltrate and tumor cells. And then of course you can look at single cells and how they interact and engage with other single cells. So to give you a sense of the problem um, or, or the complexity that this approach entails, here's just a thought experiment showing as many parameters as I could think of that when multiplied together give you billions of possible parameters to evaluate for an optimum signature. So this is clearly a daunting task, um, which is to say that there's incredibly complex. However, as our next speaker will show and other investigators have shown, is that simply looking at a relatively small number of these parameters and implementing it in a clinical and translational research setting has the ability and potential to improve dramatically on what you can obtain using traditional biomarker strategies in immuno-oncology. One example is a study out of Johns Hopkins, their Astropath Initiative, where vector polaris spatial phenotyping data was used in a study in melanoma to look for spatial signatures. They used the tools at Johns Hopkins that were traditionally used to study the night sky and turn them inward into the tumor microenvironment. This was effectively a big data engine producing a lot of data that was ultimately validated in melanoma and the signature was found in a relatively rare uh, phenotype an infrequently studied cell type, FOXP3, PD1 and CD8 uh, marker positive, I believe where these cells were located in the tumor and how many of them there were was predictive, uh, more so than IHC, TMB, or MSI. And all of this algorithm development could be implemented in, in a vector polaris in standard informed software. And so at this point, I'd like to stop the introduction and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sebastian Marowitz. Uh, from the Leibniz Lung Center in Germany. He'll be exploring how some spatial profiling uh, work was done uh, with, with he and colleagues in lung diseases using a vector polaris and multiplexed IHC and FFPE patient samples. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome everybody to my talk. First of all, I would like to thank Kevin for the introduction and the organizers as well as Acquired Biosciences for having me here with you. I would like today to talk about a showcase for hypothesis-driven analysis on cohort level using formal and fixed perfume embedded patient samples in the context of lung diseases. So, uh, disclosure at first, um, I have no conflict of interest to disclose and all images were acquired on Echoia Vector Polaris using motif scan at 20x magnification. Image analysis was conducted using a informed software and Phenopta reports are packaged, as well as a Tidyverse GDPR for data presentation. As an alternative to Acoya's informed software, I could also alternatively highlight QPath open source software developed by Pete Bankhead currently in Edinburgh. Please browse this um, web page to get a hint on the software or read the paper published um, in Scientific Reports 2017. It is an awesome piece of open source digital pathology software. So today's talk will be in a low plex setting. So speaking of low plex multiplexed immunochemistry, multiplex immunofluorescence, we will see pictures of um, images with panels less than 10 or less than 20 markers. And um, this might sound currently a little bit outdated, but I would like to show you the benefits of using low plex, but in a high or larger cohort volume. So speaking of low plex, um, we have CD20 for staining of B cells. We have CD8 for effector T cells. There is CD3 as a PAN T cell lineage marker, CD68 for alveolar macrophages, 
FOXP3 for regulatory T cells and for instance pancytokeratin for detection of um, tumor cells as well as epithelium. Although or, or by um, using a low plex setting, it has some certain advantages. So the combination of few markers that co-localize, for instance, CD3, CD8, or FOXP3 on the same cell or same compartment creates already an abundance of phenotypic combinations. So these combinations are further amplified by the amount of tissue segmentation classes. So how many different morphologically distinct categories are detected and defined by the user, these categories will further amplify um, the already observed phenotypic combinations. Furthermore, um, those spoken phenotypic combinations with respect to different tissue segmentation results are also amplified by spatial metrics. So for instance, the mean distance of a CD3 positive, CD8 positive cell to CD20 positive B cell can be computed in tumor and stroma compartment as well as any other detected tissue segmentation result. So this can lead to dozens, if not hundreds of variables without any clinical data or metadata. So once uh, it is merged and annotated with clinical and patient-centric data, um, feature selection is a crucial step but nevertheless, the whole workflow using the Vector Polaris system with the downstream software um, is a workflow that's manageable for non-data scientists without any coding knowledge. So it is suitable for the average wet lab Joe. Um, there are different ways to analyze spatial data in the context of paraffin embedded tissues. I want to speak today about two or three of them. Um, those the list or the, the ways to analyze spatial data that is, pro, that is very likely not a finite list, but just a short glimpse of what information can be deduced out of the tissue. So as one of the very first steps in image analysis, there's usually a kind of tissue segmentation where the user um, trains an algorithm to differentiate the different morphological um, compartments of a tissue. For instance, the stroma can be differentiated from the tumor islands or vest blood vessels can be detected or necrosis or anything else. And by having a tissue segmentation, it will create a border. And that border can be actually you can be can actually be in use and applied to compute cellular distances. For instance, the distance from a border for instance, for the distance of a CD8 from the tumor margin that penetrates into the tumor tissue. So that distance can be calculated to get information on how deep an immune cell was able to invade into the tumor cell or into the tumor compartment. Furthermore, um, the next way to analyze spatial data would be to focus on a certain cell, a certain, certain cell type, a cell of origin, and to look then which other cell types, as indicated by different um, histological markers, are at a given distance related to that cell. So by that, we are able to compute cellular distances in between cells. For instance, the mean distance from a CD8 cell to a CD68 cell. Furthermore, we are able to uh, start again from a cell of origin, a cell of interest, and define a radius to create a hypothetical circle around that cell of origin, a cell of interest. And within that given circle, we can compute the average amount of cells being within that radius. That actually leads leads us to the measurement of cells within a given radius, for instance, the mean number of CD20 positive B cells around an CD3 cell. Um, today, I would like to speak about two of these spatial metrics. The one would be the cellular distances in between cells, and the other one would be 
cells within a given radius. And I would like to show you about or in about two low-plex settings, what kind of data can be analyzed by that and what kind of questions can be asked and what results will be presented. So speaking about cellular distances in between cells, there are multiple ways to show or plot that kind of data. One of that actually is a density plot, as people might be already familiar with, and in form of histogram from flow cytometry data. So on the x-axis, you will usually find a mean distance to a cell type of interest. And on the y-axis, there usually is a scale um, that's called a density. And that scale is related to abundance of cells. And within that given plot, we can actually define a cell type one, a cell type two, a cell type three, and um, depending on the height or the height of each of those peaks is, is being defined as the amount of observations where a certain cell type, for instance, cell type one, is at a given distance to the cell type of interest. And this is then computed for hundreds of observations among different patients within a cohort. And because we have uh, mul multiple observations, we can calculate the mean distance within a given cohort for a cell type one to the cell type of interest. And we can calculate furthermore this for any other cell types. And the combinations of these mean distances of one cell type to a cell type of interest can be somehow used as a so-called spatial fingerprint. And the spatial fingerprint doesn't necessarily have to be the same within a, within a cohort of patients. So these spatial fingerprints might be very different in between patients and that information of um, mean distances to cells of interest can be used to probably draw clinical or maybe therapeutical conclusions. So a spatial metrics or spatial metrics as a numerical unbiased representation of morphological processes are the are somewhere like turning an image, what we have in mind by looking at it into a number that can be further processed and um, doing downstream analysis in an unbiased and reproducible manner. So speaking about nearest neighbors and distance analysis, there are certain caveats to consider. For instance, take the mean distance of C20 positive cells to C68 positive cells. And then you plot the mean distance of CD68 positive cells to CD20 positive cells. And you could see that they correlate very poorly. Um, there's no real linear um, correlation um, among these. And um, so distances are not necessarily reciprocal. So it might really depend on the origin of a cell or from, from which cell to another cell a distance is calculated. Coming back to the analysis of lung cancer or non-small cell lung cancer tissues, on the next few slides, I would like to show some data that has been mainly deduced from the stromal part because I was interested in immune cells and distances in between immune cells. So when I applied that low plex panel to a couple of cohorts of non-small cell lung cancer patient, patients and um, calculated the mean distances in stromal compartments, it was clear in the end that the patients organized themselves in an unsupervised manner and that resulted in three different groups of, um, of patients who behave differently. And these three groups are probably driven by three clusters of cellular distances that I believe are the driver behind that um, variance and, and the driver behind how these patients behave differently within the stromal 
immune cell composition and immune cell organization. So one of the three clusters would be the mean distance to CD20 positive cells. The next cluster would be the mean distance to FOXP3 positive cells. And the third cluster would be the mean distances of cell, cells towards CD68 positive cells. So um, by aligning um, multiple variables from the distance calculations, one can also observe um, distances or cellular events that behave very comparably. So here we have, for instance, CD68 positive cells, or the mean distance of CD68 positive cells to CD20 positive cells. And we have on the x-axis, CD3 positive, CD8 negative, which are likely to be CD4 positive, and their distance to CD20 positive cells. And again, here you can see that both distances appear to be very, very comparable in stroma compartments as well as tumor compartments. So CD68 positive cells probably have a comparable distance to CD20 positive cells as CD4 positive, CD8 negative T cells, which is of interest, I would say. Um, so focusing again on that cluster of cells having a mean distance to CD20 positive cells and that drives or is probably a driver of that group accumulation among non-small cell lung cancer patients. Uh, we can have a closer look on what's going on with the mean distances to CD20 positive cells. So here we have plotted for the stroma and the tumor from patient material from the tumor center and the tumor margin. Uh, we see how, how the patterns actually look different in stroma and tumor. And um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if we just focus on CD20 positive cells and their distance to other CD20 positive B cells, we can easily see that for most of patients here, um, there is a very short distance in between B cells. So here, here we have the 100 micron, 100 micron meter distance from a B cell to another B cell and the mean across the cohort is somewhere well below 50 microns. So apparently B cells tend to stick to other B cells very frequently among patients in the stroma compartment, but not in the tumor compartment, as you can see here, where the density is way more evenly or way more differently distributed. So we then calculated the mean distance between CD20 positive to CD20 positive cells, and it's no surprise to see that there were statistically significant differences in between stroma and tumor in one cohort and with a similar trend in an independent different cohort. Furthermore, if we go back to the images and, and how they actually look like, you can see here for one patient having a very short distance in between CD20 positive to other C20 positive cells, that the cell classifier will highlight those, those stroma organizations and it can actually then use the calculated mean distance between a B cell and another B cell and use that for survival analysis. And you can see here for overall survival or disease-free survival, in a cohort of surgically treated non-small cell lung cancer patients, but patients who have a short distance in between B cells have a longer overall survival and a longer disease-free survival. So the short distance of CD20 to CD20 cells is likely to be represented by tertiary lymphoid structures, and these structures have been well described to be an independent prognostic marker for patient survival and even immune checkpoint therapy success uh, in different types of cancer. The beauty of this actually is it is independent of any image annotation, any, any subjective scoring or rating. It is just based on the calculation of cellular distances and that actually 
brings back the beauty of an image connected to the real world numbers. So coming to the next spatial metric, cells within a given radius, I would like to show some very short results of a study we published recently. So speaking about cells within a given radius, um, we applied in the laboratory of Bernie Fox in Portland, Oregon, two panels to a cohort of non-small cell lung cancer patients, where we first of all looked into T cell proliferation and expression of PL1 or macrophages, FOXP3, Tregs, or CD8 cells, all of them combined. Also with um, phosphorylated SMA3 as an activation marker for activated transforming growth factor beta signaling. Um, we use punches from different regions of patient tumors and applied a, a digital pathology workflow to it where we use machine learning based feature selection for variables impact and survival outcome and applied cells within cells and cells within a given radius of, an, of other cell types and that actually based on findings um, of the Fox lab where they found out earlier in 2017 that an oral squamous cell cancer, um, a radius of 30 micron around CD8 cell and when there are high numbers of PD1 expressing cells in tumor or stroma within that 30 microns around CD8 cells, patients tend to have a shorter survival. So we apply that to our cohort on different observations where we actually focus more on the effect of FOXP3 regulatory cells within a given radius around CD8 cells within the tumor, so not in the stromal part. So we wanted to see what, what kind of signals FOXP3 positive cells are likely to exchange with the effector T cells. And we also used accessory markers like PDR1, Phosphosma3, and combinations of those to, um, to compute uh, um, cells, being, cells being around CD8 positive cells that have either, either one of the markers or both of the markers. And you can see here that a high number of FOXP3 cells, independent of any other accessory marker, is already a good indicator for a shorter disease-free survival or a shorter overall survival in non-small cell lung cancer patients. But once you take pd one into consideration, um, the group or the cohort um, stratifies even better. And combined with SMART3, or with phosphor SMART3 and pd one um, patients having a high number of pd one expressing phosphor SMART3 positive FOXP3 cells around CD8 cells is already a very good indicator for a very short survival and a very quick relapse. But once you take only phosphor SMART3 into consideration in FOXP3 regulatory T cells, um, you can stratify the cohort to patients who have a very, very early relapse. So I would like to sum up the previous slides with, or oh, I, I hope I could um, convince you that the use of spatial profiling in localized, set, in localized settings enables a hypothesis-driven analysis on cohort level for biomarker discovery, for instance, as the cellular distance, and also spatial profiling aiming at activation markers or ligand receptor interaction might be a promising tool for um, development of therapeutic inhibitors. So there's been recent development, for instance, in dual targeting of TGF beta PDL1. And uh, I'm very convinced that um, multiplex imaging, multiplex immunohistochemistry, and digital pathology workflows actually really might drive those efforts. So I would like to thank the people involved in, in these studies that are our clinical partners at different uh, academic clinical centers. We have close collaboration with Raj Kumar Savai, Max Planck, Bad Nauheim regarding TGF beta targeting. Um, we investigate also further phosphor isoform signaling with a PhD student in our lab. 
and I have, I'm very grateful to have spent some wonderful time in Bernie Fox's lab in Portland, Oregon, where we discuss and work a lot on multiplex stimulus chemistry applications with regards to um, immune checkpoint blockade. And we also had some great time with Patrick Mick and Karin Estrell in Uppsala, where we focus mainly on cancer associated fibroblasts and non small cell lung cancer tumor microenvironment. So thank you very much for your, um, for your time and I'm happy to take questions during the later on Q&A session.